Okay, so in section 4 of 6, um, we're talking about how in order to figure out the probability of something, remember you have to take the number of favorable outcomes divided by the to total number of possible outcomes. And um, in order to do that, you need to know how many there are. And sometimes when we're counting things, it, it can get kind of huge, the numbers. So we need some special techniques to, um, to count them. Um, the basic idea here is that if you have um, events that have uh, two parts to them, like for example, um, if I'm going to roll two dice. So I, I have a red die and a green die, and I'm going to roll the dice and see what the result is. I can think of that as being two parts to the task of rolling the die, rolling the red die and rolling the green die. And if I think of it that way, it's much easier. I can think, OK, how many results are there on the red die? Six. How many results are there on the green die? Six. And we have this thing called the fundamental counting rule that says all you have to do is multiply those two values together, and you get the total number of combinations that I, sh I shouldn't use the word combinations because that's reserved for something special. But you get the total number of possible outcomes for this two-part task. So it would be 36 possible results when you roll two dice. So if one event can occur in m ways and another in n ways, m times n ways is the total number of possible outcomes. Um, we also talked about in the, um, in the live chat that, um, well, first of all, this extends not just to two-part tasks, but three-part tasks, four-part tasks, and so on. So um, you're going to get these strings of products, right? And a lot of times, those strings of products will involve a, a number sequence like you see here, like 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, or 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. A number and all the numbers one less than, one less, one less, all the way down to 1. So since that calculation occurs a lot in these counting problems, we, we gave it a shorthand notation. You know how much we love that in math. Mm -hmm. So this is 4 with a little exclamation mark is called 4 factorial. The exclamation mark is the factorial symbol. And it just means multiply 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Of course, if you have 25 factorial, that's a pretty long string of numbers to plug into your calculator. So all your TI-30X2S calculators have the factorial function. So what you're going to do is look, at, look for the pi button. And under the pi button, there should be a PRB. PRB button, do you see it? So don't hit it yet. <laughs> First type in four, then you're going to hit the PRB, which means probability calculations. And then what should appear on your screen is um, it'll say NPR, NCR, and the factorial button. And the NPR is underlined. So arrow to the right two times so that the factorial is underlined and hit enter. Okay, then on your screen you will see four factorial and you have to hit enter again and you should see 24. So I, I want to make it clear that I'm, my expectation is that as much as possible you're using your calculator and not doing these calculations by hand. I show you how to do them by hand because um, sometimes there's a little bit of insight that we get from the formulas, but um, you certainly don't have the time to do them all by hand. Okay. So the time I said that often in counting problems the factorial thing pops up. This is how it pops up. When we want to find the number of permutations or arrangements, another word for permutation is arrangement. Of a certain number of objects. Okay, like for example, let's say I had six students come up here and sit in these six chairs, right? But then I'm going to rearrange the students. And I want to know how many different possible ways can I seat those students. By the fundamental counting principle, 
we can just multiply the number of ways to do each part of the task if we break the task, if we break this outcome down into parts. So for example, I could say, okay, there's seat number one, seat number two, seat number three, seat number four, seat number five, seat number six. I'm going to, I like when I'm using the fundamental counting principle, I like to draw little blanks to represent the parts of the task. And then I think, how many ways is there to do each part of the task? So for example, the first seat, okay, how many students do I have to pick from? Six, six. six of them. But once I've seated that first person, that person can't sit next to themselves, right? So there are now five, and then four for the next seat, and then three possibilities for the next seat, and two and one. So you see how when we have six people and we arrange them in six seats, we get the, the fact six factorial? I have a question. Mm -hmm. When you were doing like license plates, mm -hmm. I remember learning this in high school, and is that the permutation? Like um, coming up with the, the rearrangement? It is. It's an arrangement. Because, for example, the license plate A, B, C, 1, 2, 3 is distinct from C, A, B, 3, 1, 2, right? Mm -hmm. So we say it's an arrangement if the order matters. Okay, this is not to necessarily mean that we are physically arranging things. That is a common misconception at first. I think when I was first learning it, that's kind of how I thought about it. But actually, it's categorizing them. Okay, so there are six categories in that license plate. There's the first letter, the second letter, the third letter, the first number, the second number, the third number. Why I'm pointing that out is because let's say um, six students are going to win six different prizes. Right? One's going to get a first place prize, a second place prize, a third place prize, and so on. That's still, I'm not arranging them, but it is technically an arrangement because I'm picking this person has this characteristic, this person has this characteristic, this prize. So you would do exactly the same thing, um, still it would be six factorial for that problem as well. Okay. All right, and yes, now, with the license plate example, it would not actually turn out to be a factorial when you used the fundamental counting principle, what would it be? You'd have 26 possible letters for the first one, but repeated letters are allowed on license plates usually, right? So you could still have 26 possibilities, 26 possibilities. Um, for the first number, you have how many digits in, in our number system? It's actually 10, ten. because you have so to count zero. zero. But did, can they put zero? Yeah. Yep. Oh. Um, and by the way, when you're working a problem like this, unless it says otherwise, you have to consider every possibility, right? So it might not say repetition of letters is allowed, but it doesn't say it's not allowed. So you just assume that it is, unless they tell you there's a restriction. So it would be times 10 times 10 times 10 in that case. Yes, to answer your question, um, that is an arrangement. How many possibilities is that, by the way, if you multiply 26 times 26 times 26, what do you get? All of it? Yeah, that's fine. Well, oh, it's a big number. Yeah, a lot. 17, 57, 6,000. Like that? Yep. Okay. So 17,576,000 different possible. Okay, well, that, you know, that's why we have license plates the constructed the way that we do, so we have a lot of possibilities, okay? Um, but again, didn't turn into a factorial that time because we didn't say, if I had said that um, we were arranging, like a license plate was gonna just have um, the letters A, B, C, D, E, or F on it, six letters, and we have six possible arrange, uh, places to arrange those, that would be a six factorial. But in this case, we had no such restriction, so you just use the fundamental counting principle. Okay, now, the factorial works then, remember I said when you had all six students and we were arranging the six students, all six of them, um, into six seats, that was six factorial. But a lot of the time, we're not gonna actually arrange all the students. So maybe, let's see, we have four, six, 10. We have 11 students in the class. 
What if I just wanted to pick six of you and then arrange you in the seats? So that is this formula here, the permutations rule, NPR. The way that we calculate that is n factorial over n minus r factorial. If you want to know why, you can always uh, look at the video on, from yesterday. But um, even though I'm telling you what this formula is equal to, where did we see the NPR on our calculator? Just a minute ago, right? In the PRB menu. Mm -hmm. So you do not have to use, unless it, you're explicitly told to use the formula for this, you do not have to. And even when you're doing your MyStatLab homework, um, you know, it might say use this formula. I, it's okay if you don't. All right, the only time I would expect it is if I like specifically say, I want to see you plug in and simplify this formula, then um, I'll give you the formula and I just want to see if you can do the calculation with it. Um, one thing I did not talk about on, and actually, I'm sorry, I can't remember if, I, if you have this on your my style lab, so I just want to check before we talk about it. If you've done the homework already, have you noticed if there's anywhere you have repeated objects? Like arranging the letters in a word, for example. Let's see. Let's go to the study plan. I'll be able to quickly see if, if I left that objective in or not. Let's see. Uh, da, da, da. Four. Let's see. Nope. Don't have to do it. Okay, let's skip it. Okay. Um, let's do one example of a permutation before we look at a combination. So let's do the example I just mentioned. There's 11 students in this class. I wanna pick six of you and arrange you in these seats. I wanna know how many ways to do that. So I know that um, there have to be these three requirements in order to or have to be satisfied in order to use this formula. We have to have n different items available. What items are we referring to in my example? Students. Students. So we have 11 different um, students available. We're going to select r of n items. We're going to select 6 of 11 items without replacement. Do you know what without replacement means? Yeah, without without putting them back. That's another way of saying there's no repetition. I can't choose one of you twice, okay? Um, we have to consider ABC to be different from CBA. So sitting the uh, student A, B, and C next to each other is different than having them sit in the order CBA. Of course it is, we're saying select the students and arrange them. So that's kind of a given. We actually use the word arrangements. You want to look for keywords like arrangement or permutation or just the context that indicates that order matters, like on a license plate. Okay? So if you have all of those requirements, which we do, we can use this NPR formula. So we're going to have N is 11, P, and then 6. This is the number of ways to select and arrange six out of 11 objects. Or we say the number of permutations of 11 objects taken six at a time. I'm assuming we were given that. Oh, so okay. given that we have uh, 11 students, and we want to select six and seat them in, you know, in a particular arrangement. How many ways are there to do that? Okay, so I'm gonna show you how to use the formula, but then I also want you to calculate it using the NPR function on your calculator. So the formula says 11 factorial over 11 minus six factorial. Thank you. 
Okay, 11 factorial is multiplying 11 times 10 times 9 all the way down to um, 5 times 4 times 3. I'm running out of space. <laughs> Let me do it over here. So it's going to be 11 times 10 times 9 all the way down to 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 over 11 minus 6 factorial is actually 5 factorial. You cannot say 11 factorial minus 6 factorial. That doesn't distribute. You just do what's in the parentheses first. So 5 factorial, which is 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. So notice that what happens is you always end up with a smaller factorial in the denominator, and you can actually just cancel them all out. So we have from 11 down to 6. Still a lot of things to multiply there. Okay, so you can try multiplying 11 times 10 times 9 times 8 times 7 times 6, or you can just plug into your calculator 11, select the NPR from the PRB menu, and hit 6, and hit Enter. Okay, so that's uh, permutations. How many ways were there for that to happen? A lot? 332,640. Is that what everybody got? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm sorry, can you repeat the answer? 332,640, that's right. Eleven. You hit the PRB button. Mm -hmm. Arrow. Well, actually, you don't even need the arrow on that one because the NPR is already underlined. Okay. Hit enter. Now you should see eleven P. Um, I'm sorry, eleven NPR on your screen. Right. Hit six and hit enter. Perfect. All right. Now. What is a combination? So, um, you know how we have those combination locks on lockers? Mm -hmm. um, you know, does the order matter on those? Yes. Yeah, which is just not good because mm -hmm. in math, combination means the order doesn't matter. So when we use a, um, a combination lock is actually a permutation because we're arranging, we're selecting and arranging three numbers usually. Um, but in any case, when the order doesn't matter, okay, so let's talk about some scenarios where order doesn't matter. So what if I just wanna select six lucky students to get some bonus points? They're all gonna get the same amount of bonus points. I just wanna pick six students out of 11 students. Does the order matter? <laughs> the order does not, you don't care if you're the first student picked or the sixth student picked, right? It doesn't matter because you're getting the same treatment. So that would be an example where we're selecting objects from a set. You actually have fewer ways to do that because we have, yes, we have different subsets of the 11 students that we can pick, so there's gonna be a lot of possibilities, but we're not then taking those and magnifying it out to even more possibilities by rearranging everybody because the order doesn't matter. So when you do combinations, you should always get a smaller number, and you'll notice in the formula, that we actually divide by um, an extra factor here and that makes the number smaller. So we get something as fewer possibilities than when we're looking at a permutation. So let's go ahead and, and do our example. So if we have a class with 11 students and we're going to uh, choose, often we say, we use the word choose when we're referring to combinations. 11 students choose six then the notation is 11C6, 11C6. Now I'm gonna plug in to this formula, but again, you don't have to use it. You can just say 11C6 using the NCR option in your PRB menu. So I'm gonna say 11 factorial, that's my N, and I'm gonna have 11 minus six, factorial times 6 factorial. 
or in other words, 11 factorial divided by 5 factorial times 6 factorial. By the way, if you're actually typing this into your calculator rather than using the NCR function, if you do 11 factorial divided by or slash, whatever, I think it shows as a slash, um, you have to put parentheses around the entire denominator and make sure that you're dividing by that number. The calculator won't understand if you don't and it'll multiply by 6 factorial instead. So um, either way, what do you get? 462. Okay, so compare that to um, 11 NPR 6 when you plugged that in and you got 332,000 some odd, right? Possibilities. Remember I said combinations, there's fewer options basically because we're not arranging them, which creates, you know, an arrangement creates a lot of extra possibilities. All right, um, oh, the, the requirements for using combinations are extremely similar to the requirements for a permutation. There need to be, we have n different items. We have r of n of them that we're selecting without replacement, meaning there's no repetition. Like I'm not gonna select one student twice and give them double bonus points. That's not gonna happen. Okay, so we consider rearrangements of the same items to be the same as the only difference. So for combinations, ABC is the same outcome as CBA. Again, the students don't care if I pick them first or last as long as they get the bonus points, right? Okay. So when you have to decide whether you're using a permutation or a combination, um, you just have to remember, think about does order matter. In both cases, you have to have a set of objects that you're selecting from, a set of possibilities that you're selecting a subset of. But um, it, if the order matters in which you pick them, then that's a what? The order matters. Permutation. Permutation. If the order doesn't matter, it's a combination, which is like unfortunate since combination locks the order matters, right? So it's, it doesn't doesn't work out well for that. Okay, so um, let's look at this example. A byte in computers is a sequence of eight numbers, all either zero or one. The number of possible bytes is two to the eighth equals 256. How did I get that? Why do I know that it's two to the eighth? So in this case, this is not, um, well, I take, take that back. You can think of it two ways. So one way would be with the fundamental counting principle. You could say that I'm going to select the first digit, the second digit, the third digit, the fourth digit, the fifth digit, the sixth digit, the seventh digit, and the eighth digit. I like to draw those little dashes to, so in my mind I can think, okay, I have eight parts to this task the different digits. How many possibilities are there for the first digit? Two. Two, a zero or a one. But also a zero or a one, and a zero or a one, and a zero or a one, and a zero. So we could multiply this all together. Or do two to the eighth. Hmm? Or do two to the eighth. Or do two to the eighth power. Okay. Did the order matter in this calculation? So are you telling me that if I put in a computer byte 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, that the computer will interpret that the same as 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1? No. No. That's different. Yeah. So the fundam in, in the fundamental counting principle, it is taking order into consideration. Again, it's assigning, it's assigning, counting the number of ways to do each part of the task. So in all three, I mean not in all three, in both the fundamental counting principle and permutations, the order matters. This is an arrangement. Why can I, let's see, why can I not um, use 
the NPR formula. What do we need that we don't have here? Something out of something. Yeah, so we're not selecting a certain number of objects out of a total number and then arranging them. So that would not be an NPR problem. Okay, um, let's look at this uh, example where we would use a counting method to uh, find a probability. Remember the whole reason we're doing the counting methods is because in order to calculate a probability, you need to be able to know how many possible outcomes there are. So it says a history pop quiz asks students to arrange the following presidents in chronological order. Hayes, Taft, Polk, Taylor, Grant, and Pierce. If an unprepared student totally guesses, what is the probability of guessing correctly? So they're saying that the number of possible arrangements, notice it's an arrangement, why is it, a, what about the problem tells you that we're talking about an arrangement, that order matters in other words? Because they're telling you to put the presidents in chronological order, right? So they're talking about order. All right, so um, how many objects do we have? We have one, two, three, four, five, six names. How many of them are we arranging? All six of them, right? So remember, that was six factorial. Six times five, for, we're going to pick for the first president, we have six options, second, five, third, four, fourth, three, fifth, two, and sixth, one, six factorial. That turns out to be 720, but I want to point out another person might have thought of this as a permutation. Okay, why? We have how many objects? We have six objects. Okay, does the order matter? Yes. And we're picking how many of the six objects? Six out of the six objects. We're picking all of them and arranging them. So if you want, you could compare this answer on your calculator to 6P6. The number of ways to select six objects out of six and arrange them. And you should get the same answer. So one student might think of using the fundamental counting principle like I did up here at the top. Another student might say, oh, I know that when I arrange n objects into n slots, that's n factorial and used a factorial. And yet another student might have said, oh, I'm selecting six objects from six objects and arranging them, that's a permutation. And they would all three be correct, okay? So there are some scenarios where you can't use all three. You don't have all those options be because it doesn't fit the characteristics for a permutation, for example. Um, or it doesn't use all the objects, so you can't do a factorial. And then you just use the fundamental counting principle. But anyway, the probability then, only one of those arrangements is going to be correct, right? So the probability that they pick that one correct arrangement, you take 1 over 720 and it turns out to be 0 0.00139. So the harder probability problems are the ones where you first have to do a counting methods problem and then use that to get your probability answer. Okay. Um, in the Pennsylvania Match 6 Lotto, winning the jackpot requires that you select six different numbers from 1 to 49. The winning numbers may be drawn in any order. Find the probability of winning if one ticket is purchased. Okay, so what you want to be thinking about, this turns out to be a combinations counting problem, but why? What are the clues in this that tell us that we have combinations? So you want to think about um, the conditions under which we use combinations. We need to have a certain number of objects, right? Do we have a certain number of objects that we're selecting from? How many objects are we selecting from? 49. 49 different numbers. We're selecting a certain subset of that. How many are we selecting? Six. Six of the 49, okay. And then, what's the big question? Does, order matter? Does the order matter? No, it doesn't. And since the order, it, so a person who has the, the correct digits, of the correct numbers on their ticket, it doesn't matter what order those numbers are in, they're gonna win. 
So that tells you that it's a combination. Okay, combination. And the clue is, the big clue is in any order. The only type of calculation we have that allows us to calculate in any order is combination. If the order matters, it has to be one of the other three possibilities. You're going to have to use fundamental counting principle, permutation, or factorial. But if it's the order doesn't matter, you have to figure out some way to use combinations, basically. All right, so here I show the formula plugged into, but I cannot emphasize this enough. You are going to save yourself a tremendous amount of time if you use the calculator function. So please make use of that. So you're just going to plug what? 49C what? 6 into your calculator and you should get 13,983,816. Okay, but that's just the first step in the problem. We want to know then what's the probability of winning if there are 13,983,816 different possible ways to select six numbers. Well, there's only going to be one of those combinations that is going to work. So one out, out of 13,983,816. Okay. All right. Let's do a quick um, uh, little review here. Um, if A and B, uh, this is some questions from chapter four. If A and B are dependent events, then how do we find the probability of A and B happening? Okay, so first, remember that this was from last class. Remember that I, I distinguished between situations with and and situations with or, right? So and always involves some kind of what? Addition or multiplication? Multiplication or always involves some kind of addition. All right, what do we multiply if the events don't affect each other's outcome? We would just multiply the probability of A times the probability of B, right? So that would have been option B. What do we multiply if the events do affect each other? Why is it A and not C? You're right. So after the A is occurring, that's the B. Excellent. So what she's saying is we first calculate the probability that A happens, and then we are going to need to account for that. So we're looking for the probability that B happens given that A occurred, not the probability that A happens given that B has occurred. OK, that would be incorrect. So the answer is A. Okay. Alrighty. You will have probably a question on your test that says just find 10 C2. Easiest question on the test, right? I have a quick question. Yeah. I mean, you can do this after, but I just I can't find it on the. Oh, no. Yeah, let's But I think I have like an older position. Maybe. No, you got it. It's this one right here. Yeah, but first, before you type that, type 10. PRB for probability. Oh, yes, yeah. and you arrow over. Anybody else having trouble finding the NCR or NPR or factorial? You have to remember those three are all in the same place, the PRB. Okay, so what did you get? 40, 40. Okay, um, also want to remind you when you have a two-part task like um, rolling two dice, it's, it's often beneficial to make a little product table. We used this the last time. I find it a, a little bit confusing sometimes when I'm trying to look at, um, say, the probability of, of rolling a total of seven or something, unless I actually look at the table. So. Don't be, um, you know, print, maybe print one of these out and keep it in your book or something for when you need it. Um, all right, that's it for chapter four. 
Now we're going to move on to chapter 5. Okay, in chapter five, we're talking about something called a probability distribution, which sounds kind of scary, but it's not. Um, do you remember what a frequency distribution was? Yes. What was a frequency distribution? That there's a range in values? Well, sometimes. Sometimes we broke it down into classes, so we had a range of values. But what, 